Hello everyone, Mr. Kazi here with another chemistry lesson and this time we're going to talk about atomic models and the electron. Now atomic models are very important to talk about because they help us to understand things. They make things a little easier and a little more uh, simplified. And the real important thing here though is the electron. What we want to get to know as we talk about these atomic models, we want to get to know the electron. Okay, the big player is the electron. And why the electron? Well, because the electron is responsible for chemical bonding, chemical formation, and chemical reactivity. It's going to be the electron and the gaining and losing of electrons and the electron configuration that makes a big deal behind these three ideas. So to us, in chemistry, the electron is the number one thing here uh, that we want to get to know. Now I tell you what, I'll tell you what, you get to know the electron. And if you know the electron and the electron configurations and how atoms gain and lose electrons, you will have the keys to understanding chemical formulas. You will have the key to understanding acids, writing chemical uh, equations. It all revolves around this idea of the electron. So we want to get to know the electron. Let's get started. Three questions that we need to answer about the electron, and that is what is the electron, where is the electron, and how does the electron behave? Okay? And in these first um, three videos that I'm going to put together here, uh, the one here about atomic models, the one about particles and the one about isotopes and ions. These videos are all going to deal with what is the electron. Then we're going to talk about later where is the electron and how does the electron behave. But right now what's going to be important is what is the electron. So scientific models. Why do we use scientific models? We use scientific models because they help us to understand things that are not directly usable. We can't use them directly. We have to uh, work with them in an indirect way because we can't see them, we can't touch them, we can't obtain them, but we want to learn about them. Now we can't see the atom. We can't see molecules. We can't see the nucleus of the atom. But what we can do is take the information and the data we have from experimentation and build models. Okay? So models are uh, representations of something that we can't see uh, directly, so they're indirect and they help us to work with it. They help us to simplify ideas. Working with a model takes a lot of the complex ideas and makes them easier to work with. So we develop models and they help us to make them more understandable. So they're representations, they simplify, and they make things more understandable. That's why we use scientific models. And that's really why you use just about any model. A model usually it's easier to work with. But there are some limitations to the scientific model. And the first thing is, is that usually scientific models are in our imagination. They might be based on scientific information, but they are not direct information. They're indirect information. And that means we have to be careful not to add things that aren't true, not to add things that are just from our imagination. Because we can do anything in our imagination. We can do absolutely anything. But that doesn't mean that everything we do in our imagination is true. If that was the case, then, you know, in my imagination, I, I can date Julia Roberts. But in reality, I probably can't. So, you know, there's limitations in our imagination. There's limitations to our scientific models. Let's keep that in mind. And if we remember that, then, uh, and also if we remember the key idea that Richard uh, Feynman says. Now, he's a great physicist one of the great minds of the, the 20th century, and, and unfortunately he passed away from cancer. But he says that if it doesn't agree with experimentation, it's wrong. And I totally agree with that. It has to agree with experimentation. It has to fit into the scientific method. And if it doesn't, it's wrong. So scientific models have limitations, but that's okay because we can experiment with them and we can continue to gather information and by the way, when we get new data, that new data is going to lead to new information 
And of course, that's going to be a new model. As a matter of fact, it leads to us to t today to talk about uh, six models. So what's important about models? Well, models are workable, guys. That's right. They're workable. They're usable. And that's what's most important uh, with science and for the scientific method. This isn't philosophy. This isn't uh, some kind of religion or anything of that nature. And uh, scientific philosophers are fine, but they don't usually experiment. And we want to get out there and we want to experiment. We want to see things that are workable. And uh, we want to base our models on workable information. If it's not workable, then it probably is uh, more imagination than it is uh, truth or reality. All right. I'm enough of an artist to draw freely upon my imagination. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. Albert Einstein. Very true. And like we said, already imagination is great and we're going to have to use our imagination you're going to have to use your imagination as i talk about these models you're going to have to imagine uh the atom you're going to have to imagine the nucleus you're going to have to imagine the subatomic particles because all i can do is describe them and give you analogies but you're going to have to imagine what they look like when you imagine them you're going to make them uh, much easier to remember and much easier to use, especially the electron. We're going to have to imagine the electron because everything's from scientific models. None of it is absolute. It's all indirect evidence. Okay? So keep that in mind. It makes things a lot easier. There are six basic atomic models that we're going to talk about. Each atomic model is going to lead to the next atomic model because there's more information. New data gives new models. All right? The first one is the solid sphere model. And then we're going to talk about the plum pudding model and the nuclear model. And these three models are going to help us to understand what the electron is, what the proton is, where the nucleus is, just kind of all general information about the atomic model. But then we're going to get into the planetary model, also known as the Bohr model, the wave mechanical model, and the quantum mechanical model. And the last three models are really going to help us to understand where the electron is, how the electron behaves, and it's going to help us to understand um, chemical bonding through the electrons. It's going to help us to understand chemical formation through the electrons. We're just going to have to learn all about the electron configuration and by learning about the electron configuration we're going to understand so much about chemical bonding chemical reactivity a lot of things are going to open up and yet even though it's indirect evidence when we go to the laboratory and we do experiments it agrees it's workable and that's you're going to find out it's one of my favorite terms in science it's workable all right Let's talk about the Greeks. The uh, Greeks did actually have some ideas about uh, materials and how materials are made up. Democritus was one of the first to state that maybe things were made up of tiny particles. And he called them uh, atomos, which means indivisible. And he thought of the material of the world and everything that was made up of as being these tiny indivisible particles kind of like a invisible little marbles and all matter was made up of these and he was kind of on the right track he was kind of already heading towards the solid sphere model but apparently he wasn't a good speaker or presenter because Aristotle beat him out everything was made up of four elements earth wind fire and water and because of that people agreed with Aristotle majority saw Aristotle's ideas as being true and correct and I think following Aristotle probably put us back hundreds of years. Science may have moved along a little faster had Democritus been a better presenter or if Democritus had uh, just uh, gotten his ideas out there, convinced people that he was correct. But Aristotle had the best ideas I guess for the people at that time. I personally believe Aristotle was a lousy scientist. Almost everything Aristotle did uh, was incorrect. And it was mostly because he didn't experiment.